welcome all of you. Some of you are here for the first time. <clears throat> welcome to Really Living. We're glad that you chose to be with us today. And we've got quite a few missing. This is a, not just typically a holiday month, but we're becoming a little bit more free. And so people are traveling. And a lot of our men are camping today. And so they decided to go and tough it out in Camp Frenda. Camp Frenda is a site that is owned by the 70 Avenues Church up in the Muskokas. And so uh, they went up there and I can imagine there's going to be some fighting over who's going to stay in the lodge and who's going to stay in a tent. And I'm assuming that the guys who are staying in the tent are going to think that they're better than the ones who are staying in the lodge. <clears throat> this whole testosterone thing just drives me nuts. That's why I'm here. Um, so if you're here, we're on Daniel chapter 10. Daniel has 12 chapters. It's in the Old Testament. And every time I talk to people, uh, well, not every time, but when I talk to some people and I tell them that I'm doing a sermon series on the book of Daniel, they go, oh, that's a difficult book. And uh, they always say, you know, I just, I, I, I'm overwhelmed by all that information. And, and, uh, and, and never mind, and you start talking about the book of Revelation, that just, that makes people vomit almost. Uh, but I can just imagine how Daniel felt. Uh, because we read the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, of Revelation with hindsight, but he was just in the moment. In the moment of all this information. And not only is the future not very bright for his people, according to what we studied last week, but actually it seems that it's also not bright for this world. Because besides Jeremiah, there really weren't too many others who had seen this kind of end to the world. And Jeremiah is definitely more brim. It talks about elements melting with fervent heat and, 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 and people on the earth like dung and all these different things. Uh, Daniel's a little softer uh, in his approach. Uh, and, so, and so this is kind of new. And ironically, what I find the most amazing about this is last week we found out that once Jeremiah discovers this, and, uh, sorry, Daniel discovers this and studies the book of Jeremiah, he puts the blame on himself. He feels responsible for all of this. You know, and I... I, tr I, I have a hard time to listen to the news now because every time somebody gets on the news or gets interviewed, they're always complaining about how somebody else has done it wrong. I never hear them saying that I did this wrong. And it's everybody else's responsibility to fix their problem. And here, Daniel in chapter 9, we find out, I have sinned, my people have sinned. Please, God, do something for us in our hearts. And in the midst of all this traffic of information of the book of Daniel, I want to make sure today that we don't miss the beautiful, the meaningful, and the divine. The sacred. Because there's more than meets the eye. And I want to just start with this quote. It's not a quote. It's something that I'm saying. So uh, it says, Daniel began to understand that a battle over keeping Israel in bondage was going on behind the scenes between the forces of good and evil. I want you to just soak this in for a minute. There was a battle behind the scenes to keep Israel in Medo-Persia. To keep them in bondage. And Daniel didn't know this. But boy, oh boy, does Daniel chapter 10 open up the curtains of the heavenly titanic struggle over Israel's bondage. And I would like to say this morning that there is a cosmic battle for every single one of our hearts.
most people are aware of the words evil and good. But most will deny that those words are actually have a form, a will, and an agenda. The 10th chapter of Daniel pulls aside the curtain and gives us a glimpse of this titanic struggle. Open up your Bibles if you have them. And we're going to start reading through the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. So it's in the Old Testament. And um, look it up. Uh, I cheated. I already opened mine up. So I'm already there. But this is not a race. <clears throat> but the last one who gets there loses. Daniel chapter 10. And we'll just start right at the beginning of the chapter. Daniel chapter 10. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. That was the name he was given when he was taken captive 70 years ago. 70 years before this verse. The message was true. But the appointed time was long, and he understood the message, and he had an understanding of the vision. What vision is this talking about? Any remember? Daniel 9 referred to that vision as well. Now Daniel tells referring to that vision as well. The vision that had a long time, what vision is that? The 2300 days or the 2300 years. And some of you are like, huh? That's because you weren't here two weeks ago. So now you're going to have to go back and listen to the sermons. Because I can't go back and go through it. But we have this vision he's talking about. And it says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. What's another word for mourning? It was praying. He talked about supplication. Talks about bringing his heart to God. So this is what's happening. For three weeks, I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all. Till three whole weeks were fulfilled. No eating, no baths. Like I said, Daniel is overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed with the prospect of what is to come. And simply put, Daniel just wants to go home. Like I said, 87 years of age he is here. We're, we're estimating here, give or take. 87 years of age. So most of his life has been living in captivity. Because we believe he was taken captive around the age of 17. 70 years of captivity. Of not living in his country. Not seeing his parents. Not seeing his family. And we have people who are complaining that the border in the United States are not open. 70 years. He just wants to go home. And I've heard some of you. Some of you say the same thing. I want to go home. I want to be with God. I don't want to be here anymore. And even those who don't even necessarily believe in God feel that way. Anybody heard of Elon Musk? Or Jeff Bezos? The SpaceX and Richard Branson is making strides with Virgin's galactic spaceship Unity. You know, you've got... The Blue Origin and the New Shepherd from Jess Bezos, which landed back on Earth successfully in December 11, 2019. And for a few million bucks, you can get on one of these rides and hopefully get away from this forsaken place. The millionaires are trying to figure out a way to leave this madness. And we're all feeling it. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're happy here and you want to stay the way it is. And, you know, or maybe you want to try to change the world. And, and I think that's good. I think that we should be trying to make things better. Where, however and wherever we can in a little corner that we live. But. I don't think it's going to get better. 
And it's been since Jesus was born and made some promises while he was on earth that we're waiting for him to come back. It's been a long time. And for Daniel, it just seemed like his suffering was coming to an end. Because as we studied last week, he saw that it was prophesied that Jerusalem would only be captive for 70 years. And he was on that tail end. And so he's praying and mourning for three weeks and no answer. Nothing is happening. Have you ever prayed and received no apparent answer? Have you ever felt like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and then you just crumble back down onto the floor? Because I really believe that Daniel felt that way. But something happens. Let's go to verse 4. This is absolutely amazing. In verse 4 it says, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris River, I lifted my eyes and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone I saw this vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so they decided to go and hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. And what Daniel experienced was so amazing and so bright that he passed out. Down on the ground on his face. Who is this being with dazzling light who considered Daniel so beloved that he would come down from heaven to be by his side. And, and, and so, that, so that you understand, if we go to the book of Revelation, oh, I got a whole bunch of stuff in my Bible here. Just go to Revelation chapter 1, because John actually experienced the exact same thing. Many, many, many years later, 2,500 years later, Revelation chapter 1. And we go to verse 12. I'll put it on the screen for you. Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 to 16. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with gold. His head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, if as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the voice of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And it's interesting because John reacts exactly the same way as Daniel did in verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But then he put his right hand on me and he said to me, get up. I don't believe that this glorious being is an angel. For many angels have appeared in the Bible and never were they ever described this way or never did they have that kind of impact on humans. No, this is not an angel. This is Jesus Christ. Because he tells John later on, I am the first and the last I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Who died and lived again? 
Jesus Christ. At least that can be follow some of these descriptions like eyes like fire and, 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 and legs like fine brass and, and hair like wool and a voice like many waters. This is none other than Jesus Christ. And could it be that Jesus also appeared to Daniel too? How comfortable, how comforting would it be to know that? We don't have a boss that is indifferent to our struggles. He came down like one of us so that he could understand. And I know that this is Hollywood and that it's staged. I know that. But those tears weren't fake and neither was his kindness. If a man can feel the pain of an employee like he did, how much more the God of heaven and earth can feel the pain of his creation and do everything in his power to help. If only our eyes could see the eternal realities, we would see Jesus by our side, assuring us that he is listening to our prayers and working out our difficulties within the means that he can. When Rena did the prayer earlier, she says, we don't always see you, but we know that you answer our prayers. She had never met the top boss before. She didn't even know who he was. And I really believe that we may think that we have it bad, I mean, come on, all of us have complained about something, right? Even if it's a toaster that doesn't work or the driver in front of us who cut us off or whatever it is. But it could be worse. Our life could be worse. We have no idea what God has protected us from. We will only know that after we will see the times in our lives when things could have been worse. We will see how the Holy Spirit has influenced us to make better decisions along the way. We will see how dependent we are on this battle that's going on behind the scenes. You see, in the book of Daniel... Uh, Jesus is not pictured sitting on his throne far away in heaven, totally disconnected and detached from this earth. In Daniel chapter 2, he reveals a dream to a king, a foreign king. Then in Daniel chapter 3, he actually comes down and he's described by the king Nebuchadnezzar as one who was like the son of God. And he is in a fiery furnace with three of his faithful followers. Daniel 5. He writes on a wall. Daniel chapter 6. He is petting lions into submission. I know I'm adding a little bit. That's not what the Bible says. But I'm just. I think he's petting the lions into submission. Daniel chapter 7 and 8. He is hardworking in. In what place? The. Heavenly, you guys have masks, so it's hard for you to speak. I get it. He's working in the heavenly sanctuary. I'm sure some of you said that. I should be asking Iani all these questions. He's going back for his fourth year of university to be a pastor. Boy, I should be testing you. I took it easy on you when you were here, man. You're lucky. And in Daniel chapter 9, he's packing his bags and he's getting ready to come to the earth to be baptized, to be crucified, and to be resurrected. The undercover boss from heaven. And here in Daniel chapter 10, he is the one who listens to every prayer and does everything in his power to change the course of history one person at a time. 
you have to believe that God is loving and powerful enough to care about your issue. Because He does. And He is not too small to care about your issue. Read it with me. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, and we'll start at verse 11. We'll continue at, at verse 11. It says, well, we'll start at verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. See, now we're getting into some intergalactic dilemma. And the angel says that from the first day that Daniel began to search humbly. It's very important. <laughs> it wasn't Daniel asking for a new car. It was Daniel putting the blame on himself that his people are captive. And he says, from the day that you began to do that, his words had been what? Heard. This is so important because sometimes we just want God to do something. Sometimes all he's going to do is hear, at least for a while. Because why didn't he feel anything until three weeks later? Let's go. Let's read because this is, this is amazing. It says here, verse 13, but the prince, this is so key, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days? For the vision refers to many days yet to come. The angel had been working on the kings of Persia. What does it mean by working? What does that mean? Trying to influence them to do what he wants them to do. You see, this is the difference between what the God that the Bible tells us and the God that some people tell us. God doesn't coerce. God just tries to influence. God had been working on the kings of Persia to help Israel. But the problem was... That somebody was standing in the way. Who? The prince of the kingdom of Persia. <laughs> Who is that? Is it some little son of Cyrus somewhere that's just getting in the way? Who is the prince of the kingdom of Persia? John 12, 31. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me who are now being drawn to the prince of this world. Who's the prince of Persia? That's right. Satan. Let 
Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Who is that? Satan. This may be news to some of you, but in the Garden of Eden, who was in charge of the garden? Who was in charge of the garden? Who created the garden? God, Jesus. Who's in charge of the garden? Who does the garden belong to? Man. Man is in charge. And when man decided to follow the words of Satan, who was the garden passed on to? Satan. Satan is now the rightful owner of what God had made beautiful. Because man gave it to him. Why? They disobeyed God and they obeyed the snake. They believed the snake. And I could get into this deeper. How in the book of Job, God has a heavenly meeting. And all the angels show up and so does Satan. And God says, what are you doing here? Oh, I've just been roaming around the earth. Because why? It belongs to me. And so I get to come to this meeting too. Obedience is synonymous with allegiance. Who you obey is who you serve. There is a behind the scenes and it is there that everything is influenced. Whether you believe it or not. We are not in charge. Unlike what this world wants you to think. We are subjects, we are created, we are designed, and we are influenceable. And they are two powers who want your heart. Every single day. And as such, we submit to a higher authority. And since Adam and Eve have sinned, the authority of this planet was passed from man to Satan. He is the prince of Persia. This is why there's this famous, pro this famous promise early on in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, that says that, you know, Eve's sin, Eve's seed will strike, will, will crush the snake's head, but not before the snake bites the heel. Of Eve's seed. Which is a symbol of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And it's interesting because from the book of Genesis. Satan is fighting a losing battle. But he is winning millions to lose with him. This is what makes me so sad. I was golfing this week. That's the first time in three weeks, okay? I'm, just in case you guys think that that's all I do. But the neat thing about golfing is that it's my chance to be with people who are not Christians. Or are not Adventists. So I love to go. And thank you for paying for all my games. I'm just kidding. I pay myself. Okay? I don't take it out of the budget. But I go out there and I get to meet guys. And this week I got to meet, I got to golf with three Portuguese. Which made it a really lively game. And... Um, and at the beginning, you know, I, they asked me right away what I do. So I told them what I do. And so the cuss words only started around the third hole instead of right at the beginning. And it was interesting because I, I really got to know them. They work together. They have a concrete business. I'm gonna, not going to say anymore because they may be watching because I gave them all my business card. And they all told me they would never come to my church. I says, okay, this is the perfect challenge. 
you tell me you're not going to come to my church? I'm praying for you. And so we started golfing together and everything else. It's amazing. Every time I golf with people who are Christians, I golf really bad. But when I golf with people who are not, I golf good because God wants to impress them. Right? So it's really not about me. But I was having a good game. And so these guys are getting a little, you know, they're challenging, right? So we start talking. They tell me about their life, their children. And, and then they're all, they, they actually are all Roman Catholics. So they started telling me about their experience in church and telling me these things. And I tell them a little bit about the oil change we did and blah, 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 all this stuff. But as we get to hold 12, 13, 14, they had five, six, seven, eight beers in them. And it's interesting, as the beers increased, the stories got sadder. One of them, his wife has left. One of them, his child, has attempted suicide. Another one is totally disenfranchised from his sister. And I started just to see the sadness in their lives. And they don't have God in their life. And I was praying so much for them because I want them to have God in their life. Because you know what? I hate Satan. I hate what he's doing to these people. I hate what he's doing to this world. He is hurting people. He is taking people to places where it gets harder and harder and harder for them to come out. But I tell you something. We got a weapon. We got a 21 day weapon. We got a 21-day weapon. Satan is fighting a losing battle, but he is bringing millions to lose with him. And that makes me upset. And that makes me want to work harder for God and less for my mortgage. Because at the end of the day, I already got a house. And in this specific case, Satan, the prince of this world, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, is resisting Daniel's prayer from being answered by influencing the mind of Cyrus, encouraging him to keep the Israelites from returning home to Jerusalem and rebuild their city. Did you know this? Satan, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, is fighting God on a single prayer from Daniel. And God's angel was struggling. Both battling for the mind of Cyrus. I want you to realize what's going on here. The angel told Daniel, I wasn't able to get the upper hand. Why? Because God never coerces the will. He never forces people to obey. He influences through the Holy Spirit and his angels. He helps and encourages, but he does not force and he does not manipulate. Every human being is free to make their own decision. God gave us free will and he continues to respect our freedom of choice, even in the crucial issues of our lives. And of the end result of this beautiful world that he just created. But prayer opens up new channels for God to work. Because of Daniel's prayers, God was able to send greater forces of spiritual power to open Cyrus's mind to the spirit's leading. And for 21 days, the eclectic battle between good and evil roared. What would have happened had Daniel stopped praying? The battle could have been lost. Satan might have well have won. We should never give up praying and supplicating with God. This is a lesson that I am drawing from this story. 
We need to lift our hands in faith higher and higher. And if we have to, like Moses, we need to have somebody hold our hand up once in a while. Francis, let me pray with you. I can tell today you don't feel like praying. And I thank my wife, Tina, for sometimes, Francis, let's pray. Sometimes it's Pastor Benton. We get into the office and we start complaining about something. And he says, Francis, let's pray. Amen. Sometimes somebody needs us to hold our hand up. And sometimes we need to hold up someone else's hand. But we should never stop praying. Because if we stop praying, that means we stop believing. If we give up praying, we leave the battle open to be won by Satan. It may not make a difference even if we pray. But it definitely won't make a difference if we don't pray. You get me? Our brother Louis, you know, was praying for one of his friends. And unfortunately, she passed away. And we prayed. Because sometimes... God will bring out the big guns. After all, in this case, he had a prophecy to fulfill. He had told Jeremiah 70 years. So Daniel tells us who showed up. Who showed up to help the angel? Who? Michael showed up. Who is Michael? So now we wanted to know who was the prince of Persia. Now we got to figure out Michael because it seems to me like the top head honchos are going right at it here. Who is Michael? And he is only mentioned a few times in the Bible. Here he is in Revelation chapter 12. It says, and a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So Michael has angels, right? Michael has angels. And Michael seems to be stronger than the devil because he kicked the devil out. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father. Who's the Son of Man? Who's the Son of Man? Will come in the glory of His Father with... Michael has angels. And he will reward each according to his work. Who is this authority who can kick Satan out of heaven? Who is this authority who has angels? Jesus. Are there other names for Jesus? Rose of Sharon. The door. Rock of Ages, Prince of Peace. Some people get confused um, because in Jude verse 9, it labels Michael as the archangel. So they don't want to say that Michael is Jesus because Jesus is not an angel. Jesus was not created. Angels were created. Jesus was not. Therefore, they struggle with labeling this Michael as Jesus. But Jesus has angels. Archangel simply means over the angels. That's what an ark is. Over the angels. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. I get excited. Sorry about it. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Who's the Lord? Who's the Lord? Jesus. He will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel. If he's not one, at least he has the voice of one. And if he has the voice of one, then maybe he is the one. Maybe he is the archangel. He has the voice of an archangel because he is over 
the angels. And this is what I really, this, 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 this gives me so much strength in battle. Michael, like any other name given to Jesus, describes a very specific attribute of Jesus. Michael means overpowering Satan. Man, you guys are dead. Are you kidding me? Whenever you are in temptation, call on Michael. Because Michael has already beat the devil, so will you. That's why sometimes God gives Jesus different names. Because different names will associate with the struggle you're going through. Prince of Peace, Rose of Sharon, Michael, overcomer over Satan. Man, I serve an amazing God. I like that name, overcomer over Satan, because like I said earlier, I'm not really happy with what Satan is doing to my friends and to my Portuguese friends and to all the different people that I know who are choosing to not be with God. How long has the devil been haunting you? How long has he been crushing you? How long has he been pushing you around? How long have you been living in sin? Or how long have you been doubting that God even exists? Or how long have you been taking pieces of God in your life but leaving the others because it just doesn't work for you? Because that's all coming from Satan. Well, here's what I have to say to that. Keep praying and Michael's going to show up. He's not too big or too important to care about what you're going through. He is the undercover boss of heaven. But when you think that you are not being heard, you must remember this. As powerful and as creative as God is, He is bound by everyone's free will. He will not coerce and He will not force. So as prayer warriors, we will no longer worry about whether or not we've been heard, will we? Because according to the story, the minute Daniel humbled himself, he was heard. As prayer warriors, we will no longer worry as to whether or not God has heard us. But rather, we will continue to pray fervently for ourselves and for those who are deeply ensnared by the devil's devilish plan, even if it takes 21 days, 21 months, or 21 years. One of my church members called me last week in praising God. She says, Pastor Francis, I have to share this with you. And I said, please do. I love positive stories. She says, my friend that I've been praying for for 40 years has asked me if I can come to your church. And she told me she would never come. 40 years of prayer. Man, we need to be a people of prayer. And I know we struggle with this, folks, because I struggle with it. We just asked, remember we asked you to put 10 names behind our strategy paper? And sometimes I go two, three days without praying for them. That's why I put it on the fridge. I see it. But why do I even need to be reminded? Why isn't my heart hungry and thirsty for those people to find Jesus like I found him? Well, we get caught up in our lives, in the news, in sports, in whatever we get caught up in. And we forget to pray. You can be the difference between life and death of someone you love. Your prayers give God permission to do more. And your continued prayers give God permission to work on your faith. Do you believe? If you believe that there's a battle for your heart and the heart of those you love, then don't 
stop praying and leave the results up to God, knowing that even though the decision is individuals, God can be pretty convincing. So much so that the Persians, you got to read this. I'm not, the Persians allowed Israel to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and gave them millions of dollars of material. Go. Here's gold. Here's cedars of Lebanon. Here's this. Here's that. Go. Go and then rebuild your worship place and start worshiping your God again. Come on. Seriously? You're losing all your free labor? You're going to give all that up? The Hebrews left their captors and they rebuilt Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and Ezra. It's all in the Bible. We are not serving a feeble, uncaring, and unknowing God. But we also have an enemy that is sly and deceitful. It tells us in Ephesians 6, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There is a battle behind the scene for your heart and for the heart of those you love. And the only weapon we have is to call upon the heavenly forces to intercede for we are not strong enough to fight against the devil. Know that when you pray, not only do you mobilize angels, you mobilize Jesus himself. When the Bible says he will never leave us and never forsake us, that's exactly what he meant. I don't have millions of dollars to buy a seat on one of those shuttles, whatever you want to call them. I found out that one of those agencies is charging $55 million for one seat. So I'd have to work at least another three years to get there. And I just don't want to use my money for that. But you know what I realized by preparing this sermon is I don't need millions of dollars. All I need is two knees and a humble heart. And he's going to come down to me. We are going to move Michael through a humble and a respectful prayer to him. We don't need any money. All we need are two knees and a humble heart. And Michael will come down to me just like he did for Daniel. So let your prayers go to heaven in faith that God hears. And trust that whatever happens is the will of God for your life and find peace like Daniel did. Because when Jesus came the first time, he came as the undercover boss. But when he's going to come a second time, there will be no cover. He will come in all of his brightness and much like Daniel we will be brought to our knees, but angels will come and lift us up and say, Stand, for your prince is here, and he has saved you with his blood. You are going to heaven. That's enough. Next week, we're going to cover Daniel's last vision. Daniel chapter 11.